Greetings, everyone. Welcome to my Life in the Universe pandemic series. So just a set of short talks about life in the universe that I hope you'll find interesting. So this talk is about how do I become an astrobiologist part two. And a couple of days ago, I posted a talk called How to Become an Astrobiologist. And I got a couple of emails from people, one asking, hang on a moment, what about all the social scientists? What happens if you're a lawyer or a philosopher? And someone else also asked me, uh, what happens if you're a geologist and you're interested in getting into astrobiology? And in my first talk, I rather tended to focus on biologists and astrophysicists. What about other sciences as well? So first of all, it's worth remembering that astrobiology is about the study of life in the universe, this replicating, evolving material that we call biology life. How did it get here on the Earth? How did it evolve? And could we find it elsewhere? That's pretty much what astrobiology is. So what I thought I'd do in this talk is just to touch on some of the key scientific questions that astrobiologists are interested in and how different sciences connect with those questions to give you some idea about how you might connect your degree or the exams you're doing at secondary school, or in fact, uh, anything you're doing at any stage of your career, how you might connect those things into astrobiology. So if we start at the beginning, the origin of life on Earth, how did that happen? What were the chemical conditions required to bring those first molecules together to form the first replicating evolving entity? That requires chemists, chemists who can study these early molecules, who can do experiments in the laboratory or carry out modeling studies to figure out how those early molecules that were available might have led to early life on Earth. So there's plenty for chemists to do in trying to unravel this fascinating question of the origin of life. Of course, they don't know what the environment of the early Earth was like, um, except from knowledge provided by both geologists and geochemists trying to understand the environment of the early Earth from the rock record, but also atmospheric chemists and physicists who model uh, using computer models the atmosphere of the early Earth to try and understand what the chemistry was like, what gases were available, what might have happened to those molecules on early Earth, what was their fate in the environment of the early Earth. So right there in the origin of life, we've got chemists, we've got geologists, uh, Earth scientists, um, atmospheric physicists, atmospheric chemists. And this is typical of astrobiology. These interdisciplinary questions that cover a wide number of sciences require lots of different people to get involved in understanding and answering these questions. So the straightforward answer is whatever science you're doing, you can probably find a connection with an interesting question in astrobiology. Once we have life on a planet, we then wonder, when did it actually emerge? What was the earliest occurrence of life on our planet? And to answer that, we need geoscientists to look at the early rock record, paleontologists to see if they can find evidence of early life on Earth, to look at things like um, fossils, fossils of early life, or isotopic chemical signatures of early life on Earth. That requires geochemists and geologists. So the fascinating question of what is the earliest evidence of life on Earth? When did it emerge? Also requires Earth scientists, chemists, and in fact, atmospheric chemists and physicists to understand the environment in which life emerged. Then we've got some life on Earth. It evolves and it goes from uh, simple microorganisms through to spaceship building primates. Uh, what is the process of biology and how does it evolve from simple microorganisms or relatively simple microorganisms to complex uh, spacecraft building primates? We need to know about the tree of life. We need to understand the genetics of life. We need to understand how cell biology changed. How did life go from single organisms to complex multicellular life? That requires an understanding of animal evolution, of cell biology, of the tree of life, of phylogenetics. And what was the earliest common ancestor of all life on Earth? That requires phylogeneticists, geneticists. So we can see that looking at the history of life on Earth from its beginnings through to the complexity of the modern biosphere requires biologists and cell biologists and geneticists and phylogeneticists. So almost every field of biology can get involved in these fascinating questions of how life evolved on Earth. Now, of course, the evolution of life didn't just occur in a vacuum. It occurred on the Earth and life co-evolved with the planet. We think, for example, the rise of oxygen uh, was related to the emergence of complex animal life. So if we want to understand that biology, we have to understand the history of the Earth and how our planet has evolved. And that requires geochemists uh, and geologists to look at the rock record through the history of 
uh, the Earth, the history of life on Earth, to try and understand the atmospheric composition, how it changed over time, to look at the chemical composition of the rocks and figure out how the environment of, of, of the Earth may have altered and thus may have altered biology and how biology itself may have altered the environment of the Earth. So there is geobiology, and that's a connection between biologists and geologists and atmospheric physicists and atmospheric chemists. All of these sciences sort of come together in a nexus to understand the evolution of life on Earth and how it has uh, co-evolved with our planet. And of course, those principles apply to other planetary bodies as well. And this brings us on to the next question of is there life elsewhere in the universe? If you want to understand, for example, the question or answer the question, uh, was there life on Mars or is there life on Mars? You need chemists to understand the history of that planet, uh, the chemical history of that planet, whether an origin of life could have occurred there and how the chemistry of that planet has changed over time to change the conditions for life. You need to be able to answer the question, are the extremes of, of Mars compatible with life? And to answer that question, you need to know about life in extreme environments on the Earth. So biologists who go off to study the Antarctic ice sheets or um, hydrothermal vents deep in the oceans and study life in extreme environments can answer the question, do the conditions on other planetary bodies such as Mars overlap with conditions where we know that life can persist on the Earth? So there we have a role for the biologists. We need to know about the geology of Mars. What is the history of liquid water on that planet? And we can look at images from rovers and from orbital spacecraft to understand the geological and geochemical history of Mars. That requires Earth scientists, geoscientists. And then we need to look at the atmospheric uh, conditions on Mars. How has the atmosphere of Mars changed over time? Uh, we need atmospheric chemists and atmospheric physicists. So again, we see all these different sciences coming together to address a single question. Uh, what is the habitability of Mars? Could it have supported life? And that's true for any planet we're looking at or any planetary body, whether it's icy moons orbiting Jupiter or Saturn, or whether we're looking for exoplanets orbiting distant stars. We need to understand their geology, their potential condition for biology, and their atmospheric chemistry and physics. So all of these scientists have a role to play to try to understand the um, the full range of conditions to be found on other planetary bodies and how they've changed over time. If we look at exoplanets orbiting distant stars, and even if we look at our own planet and try and understand its history, we have to understand the evolution of stars. Our own star has affected the climate of our Earth and the climate of other planets in our solar system. Uh, other stars will affect the atmospheric chemistry and physics of distant um, planets orbiting uh, those stars, exoplanets. And so here is a role for astronomers and astrophysicists to find other planets orbiting distant uh, stars and to allow us to study their atmospheres and perhaps to look for biosignatures, to look for signatures of life. All of these questions will require powerful telescopes and astrophysicists to understand these planets, to look for them and to examine the way in which their parent stars have influenced the development of these planets and whether they're in fact suitable for life. All of these questions, whether we're looking for um, evidence of life on Mars or studying the atmospheric physics and chemistry of a distant exoplanet require engineers. The engineers must build these spacecraft, must build these sensors or must build the telescopes to look for exoplanets. So if you're an engineer and you're interested in astrobiology, you can go from everything from building tiny instruments to look for uh, gases, to sniff gases on Mars or to look for life through to building giant telescopes to search for exoplanets in future astronomical missions to look for those planets. There's a whole range of engineering skills and knowledge at different scales that are necessary to address some of the key questions in astrobiology. So there's a very good career open to you if you're an engineer interested in astronomical engineering or planetary sciences engineering. Many of the questions in astrobiology interface with social sciences. For example, uh, if there was life on Mars, would we be worried about contaminating that life with microbes on spacecraft sent from the Earth? These are partly scientific questions. Will microbes survive on Mars? Will they contaminate a potential Martian biosphere if such a thing exists? But they're also legal questions and they are questions of ethics. Is it ethical to contaminate another planet? What sort of uh, regulations will we put in place to protect other planets in planetary protection? So this is where the social scientists 
and philosophers have contributions to make to astrobiology. Astrobiology is as much about the human future beyond the Earth as it is about the search for early life on Earth and the search for life elsewhere. It's also about um, how we ourselves will spread out into space. And as we go into space, we take these philosophical and legal questions with us. Another fascinating question, a little bit more speculative, is if we were to make contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, perhaps the most optimistic outcome of a search for life elsewhere, what would be the consequences of contact with extraterrestrial intelligence? What are the implications for our society? And even if we were to find no uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, let's say we were to conclude that our civilization is likely alone in the universe, what are the philosophical implications of coming to a conclusion that we are alone? The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a waste of time and our civilization is going to die alone in the universe. Uh, what impact does that have on our understanding of our place in the universe and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter if we find life elsewhere in the universe or not. Either way, there are fascinating philosophical questions to do with our civilization and our perspectives on ourselves. But as I said earlier, there are also more prosaic, immediate questions about, um, about astrobiology contaminating other planets that have legal implications. There are other questions like if we go and build a station on another planet, who owns that land? Who owns the moon? Who owns uh, Mars, for example? Or who owns the landing site around where you've built your station? These may not seem like astrobiology. They're not so much science questions, but they are um, legal and ethical questions that are linked to this uh, ambition to spread human life out into the solar system to explore other planetary bodies that is itself linked to the question of the expansion of life beyond the Earth, which is in many ways um, astrobiology. So in summary, there is no limit to the number of sciences or areas of social sciences that can link into astrobiology. There are many fascinating scientific questions that come under the general banner of, of astrobiology. And regardless of what you've chosen to do in your secondary school or in your degree or in your PhD, you can almost certainly find a way to get involved and take an interest in astrobiology. I, mean, I really recommend that you look at the questions in astrobiology, think where the connections are with your own expertise, and then find a way to get involved, take an interest, or even make a direct contribution through scientific papers or going to conferences and discussing your ideas with other astrobiologists. So it's wide open and you can get involved uh, in any way you choose. So those are some uh, answers to the questions about careers in astrobiology, uh, this fascinating area looking at life in the universe. Thank you for joining me. Uh, take care of yourselves. Bye.